testing. There we go. Good morning. Uh, the children may be dismissed at this. No, they're not. The children are not dismissed. <laughs> That's right. I'm doing a pre program thing that I've always done. So, yeah, thank you for the guardrails there. Our text this morning is Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 23, a relatively long section, but it all runs together. So if you would turn with me to Mark 7, verses 1 through 23, we're going to read the whole section together, and then we're going to go ahead and look at it in more detail. There's a lot here, and we're not really going to have time this morning to give it the justice that it needs because it's really a potent section, Uh, but we'll give it a try this morning. Mark 7, verse 1 says, The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen some of his disciples were eating bread with with impure hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. The the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the the, uh, tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And he said to them, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God you hold, the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of his father and mother should be, is to be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is to say given to God, you, will no longer, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition which you handed down. And you do many other such things as that. After this, excuse me, after he called the crowd to him, and again, he began to say to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, ears to hear, excuse me, let him hear. And when he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? But it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For within, out of the heart of men proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. So last week, we saw Jesus walking on the water to meet his disciples who were stuck in contrary winds as they were rowing on the Sea of Galilee. And our text this morning picks up some time after that event, but we're not sure how long. All we know is that after Jesus walked on the water at the end of chapter 6, he and, disciples, he and his disciples excuse me, landed back on the west side of the sea in a town called Gennesaret, and we see that in verse 53 of chapter 6. And he continued to minister from there, traveling through various towns and villages in Galilee, healing the sick, and we see that in verses 54 through 56. So Jesus was still ministering in Galilee in Mark 7, where the text picks up. Uh, When some of the scribes and Pharisees at that point came to him uh, from Jerusalem, they traveled to see him, we see in verse 1. And the text tells us that these religious leaders noticed Jesus' disciples eating with impure hands in verse 2. Now, by impure hands, the text isn't speaking of dirty hands or hands covered in filth from working or whatever. It's talking about hands that are impure because they have not been ceremonially washed as prescribed by the Jewish tradition. And Mark goes into detail in a parenthetical statement about this in verses 3 and 4. I'm not going to revisit that again, but I'm going to summarize it uh, to help you wrap your minds around what's going on here. But basically what Mark is saying is this. The good, God-fearing, Bible-believing Jews of that day did not eat without first observing the elders' tradition of washing their hands. And by elders' tradition, 
The text is not speaking of current religious leaders or officials of the synagogue in that day. It's not speaking of that. It's speaking of great rabbis and experts in the law of old, like Hillel and Shammai, who systematized methods for keeping God's law. And these, these systematized methods were emphasized with as much importance as God's law itself. And if anything, these traditions were emphasized even, as even more important than God's law, which is something we're gonna talk about a little bit more as we go along. But the word translated carefully in verse three, if you look in the text, it talks about car- carefully washing. Uh, the word carefully there is translated pugme in the Greek, and it literally means something along the line of clenched fist or up to the elbow. It's referring to a ceremonial washing method prescribed by the elders where the hands are basically held fingers up when water is poured over them and then each fist is clenched and rubbed into the other hand. So again, water is poured over your hands with your fingers facing up and then afterwards your hand, your fist is clenched and you rub it into your palm each side and once that's done, you take your fingers and point them down, and then water is poured over them again, and that completes the ceremony. That's basically the idea of ceremonial washing there. Something along that line is what was being described here. And Mark also explains in verse four that there were all kinds of traditions like these which were designed to ceremonially cleanse that literally everything that the average Jew came in contact with in this day. And again, those who took these traditions seriously and adhered to them in their daily lives were the ones who were considered good, God-fearing, Bible-believing Jews in this day. And those who ignored them were viewed as people who didn't really make God a priority in their life. There were those people that really didn't consider God in their day-to-day lives and didn't consider his will, just didn't make him the priority that they should, that kind of person. That's the way they were viewed if they didn't take these things seriously. With this in mind, the religious leaders really, really took note of the fact that Jesus' disciples didn't ceremonially wash before they ate like every good, God-fearing Jew is supposed to do. And though Mark doesn't say it here, we know that Jesus himself didn't ceremonially wash before meals either. We don't see it here, but we see this in Luke 11. Here's an example in Luke 11, uh, verses 37 and 38, where it says, now when he had spoken, uh, this is Jesus, by the way, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him, and he went in and reclined at the table. When the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised that he did not first ceremonially wash before the meal. You see it there. Uh, So Jesus didn't do it either, and he shocked people in the same way. So in our text, both Jesus and his disciples were openly foregoing a practice that Jewish society considered to be essential to their spiritual health. That ceremonial washing thing was very important to them. They considered it very seriously. Now, a good way to wrap our minds around what's going on here might be to consider the practice of prayer before our meals today, the practice of saying grace before you eat. Let me just ask you a basic question here. How many of you, when sitting down to a meal, always first close your eyes and fold your hands and give God thanks for the food and ask his blessing upon it before you eat eat of it? How many of you do that? It's okay. How many of you practice, practice this no matter where you are? Whether you're alone, with your family at home or whether you're in a restaurant in public, doesn't matter where you are, you always, always, always close your eyes, fold your hands, say grace before you eat. Doesn't matter, yep, always, good. Now obviously, there's nothing wrong with this in and of itself, but in order to get under what's going on in our text, we need to look at the practice of praying before meals a little bit more closely because it can help us to understand what's going on. So I'm gonna ask again a question about praying before meals, but think of it this way instead. Imagine that I invite you over to my house for dinner and all the food is set out and you join Holly and I and our children at the table. And so you sit down and we sit down and just as you are about to, you're you're folding your hands, you're closing your eyes, you're preparing, you're readying yourself for me to say the blessing. And just as you're about to, to hear that happen, you look up and you see Holly and I and the kids all tearing into the food without saying grace. Imagine that for a minute. What would you think? How would that make you feel? What kind of spiritual conclusions might form in your minds about me and my family if you saw us do that? Would you be shocked, you know, appalled, that kind of thing? That sense of shock is what the religious leaders are experiencing in our text when they saw that Jesus and his disciples bypassed ceremonial washing before they ate. They were appalled that someone claiming to be a religious authority 
would completely bypass a religious observance that they considered to be essential to their walk with God. Does that make sense? They were shocked in the same way that someone might be shocked if they sat down to dinner with me and I didn't pray before I ate, something along that line. Now, the question that might be following in your mind, it's worth mentioning just briefly here, is Pastor Dan, are you saying that prayer before meals isn't a biblical mandate? Are you saying that prayer before meals is merely a religious tradition like ceremonial washing? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And now I'm the first to acknowledge that prayer before meals happens in the Bible. In fact, we saw Jesus when he fed the 5,000 with the loaves and fish. We saw him bless them before he broke them and gave them to the people. And so Jesus and the saints often prayed before they ate in the Bible. There's no question about that, but that doesn't make prayer before meals a biblical mandate. Why? Because one of the basic rules of biblical interpretation is that description doesn't necessarily mean prescription. Again, description doesn't necessarily mean prescription. In other words, just because we can observe the saints doing things in the scriptures doesn't necessarily mean that we must do it that way today. Just because we see them doing it then doesn't mean that that is a prescription that we have to do today. If it was, then all the women in the room would have their heads covered and be silent in the church because we observe that as well. You see what I'm saying? Just because we see it there doesn't mean it's, it's a prescription, a mandate for today. And in the same way, prayer before meals is not a biblically mandated thing. It is a religious tradition that we choose to observe in our devotion to God. And that is totally, totally fine in and of itself. There's nothing wrong with that. And my point here isn't to talk you out of praying before before meals. I pray before meals, okay? I'm not talking about that or preaching against it in any way. My point here is to show you that we have our religious traditions today. Today we have our religious traditions just like the Jews in Jesus' day had their religious traditions. Would you believe me if I told you that? We have our traditions today. They had their traditions then. They may have had more than we do today, but we still have ours. And sometimes these traditions can become more essential to us than the scriptures themselves. Sometimes these traditions can become more essential to us than the Bible itself. Sometimes they can become a necessary part of, of things that we have to do for our spiritual walk. Uh, we can actually feel that we can't honor God without them. Uh, and sometimes we can even go as far as to gauge another person's spirituality based upon them. So, you know, that's why I asked the question before. Imagine if I sat down and started eating and didn't pray before the meal. Could you still respect me as a spiritual authority in your life? Or would it be a deal breaker for you if you saw me do that? If it's the latter, that indicates some things about how you hold prayer before meals. And that's just an example, okay? In the text, Jesus and his disciples didn't ceremonially wash their hands before they ate their food. Now, they didn't put down the practice of ceremonial washing in general. They didn't criticize other people for doing it. They simply didn't practice it themselves. But this omittance of tradition was absolutely appalling to the religious leaders because they viewed it as essential to walking with God. Does that make sense? They were appalled. He wasn't putting it down, but because he didn't do it, they were appalled because they viewed it as essential. For this reason, the religious leaders publicly question Jesus' omittance of this ritual in verse five of the text, and so I'll put it up on the board. The Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? Now, they weren't asking this question to learn from Jesus on this issue. They were asking publicly in order to cast doubt on Jesus' spiritual integrity in the eyes of everyone looking on. You get that? They're, putting him, they're trying to put his feet to the fire and, and make him look bad, to bring doubt to his spiritual integrity in the eyes of the people. They were attempting to suggest that Jesus couldn't possibly be of God because he didn't ceremonially wash his hands before meals. And this was not unlike a person today suggesting that someone isn't really walking with God unless they say grace before they eat. Something along that line is what's going on here. Now this question slash accusation triggered three instructive responses by Jesus, one to the religious leaders and two others to the crowds looking on, which will serve as our points for the remainder of today's study. And these responses help us to understand the true nature of spiritual purity, and it helps us to, to avoid beliefs and practices that steer us away from spiritual purity. So buckle up and here we go, all right? The first response was to the religious leaders who asked the question uh, initially, and his response can be summarized in this way. You're not clean despite your faithful adherence to ceremonial washing. In reality, 
Your practice of ceremonial washing is blinding you to your defilement. And it's a mouthful, so I'll say it again. You're not clean despite your faithful adherence to ceremonial washing. In reality, your practice of ceremonial washing is blinding you to your defilement. Jesus said that these religious leaders outright violated the commandments of God. And in the text, he explained how they used a loophole in the system of their, of their traditions to violate the command to honor your father and mother. He said that in verses 12, 10 and 12, we read through it. And he also said this is one of many ways that they do this. It, it, he illustrated one, but they had lots of ways that they did this, that they used their tradition to violate the very commands of God's law. However, the problem goes deeper here. Because not only are the religious leaders sinning against God, they're doing that, they're sinning against God, but at the same time, they also had the audacity to question Jesus' spiritual integrity. See what I'm saying? Jesus is pointing out that they're flagrantly sinning against him, and at the same time, they have the audacity to question his spiritual integrity because he didn't wash his hands ceremonially. Now, this action is kind of insane, that's his point here, and the insanity of this action reveals two problems with the religious leaders. Um, these aren't in your outline, I apologize, so you'll have to write these in, and I'll try to go slow so you have time to get them, okay? First, the religious leaders valued their traditions more than they valued the law of God itself. The first thing that this revealed was that, that, they, va was that they valued their traditions more than they valued the law of God itself. Now, Jesus stated this explicitly in the text, and I'm going to advance past it, but I'll come back to this, I promise. If you don't have it down yet, I'll put it back up on the board. But he stated this specifically, explicitly in the text in verses 8 and 9. In verse 8, he said that they neglected the commandment of God, and they held to the tradition of men. And in verse 9, Jesus said, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. You see, they valued the tradition more than they valued uh, the commandment of God. And so the religious leaders were able to rationalize their insane attack on Jesus' spiritual integrity because deep down they placed more spiritual value on their religious traditions than they did on the law of God itself. That's why they were able to rationalize that. Of course, they would never have admitted to this, but their actions prove that, they, they, that this is their value system. This is the way that they thought. Now with this in mind, do you think it's possible today to hold our religious environments and practices, that is to say our churches and our buildings and our singing and our fellowship gatherings and all that kind of stuff, do you think it's possible to hold those things as more important than God's words itself? Do you think it's possible that Christians today could do that? Is it possible that preserving these things can become more important to us than obeying the scriptures themselves? Can you imagine a scenario where that would happen? And if yes, what would that look like? I suppose there's lots of indicators here, but one would be, the main thing to watch for would be, is that there would be an awful lot of rationalizing sin in order to preserve our institutions. A lot of turning the blind eye to things that are wrong, that we know are wrong, in order to preserve the institutions and the traditions. This is basically what happened to the religious leaders, and it can happen to us too. And the way that it does is when we value our traditions and our systems and our institutions more than the word of God itself. That's how they got into this mess. It had been going on for a long time, all right? But secondly, the religious leaders' obsession with their tradition prevented them from seeing their own sin. Their obsession with their traditions prevented them from seeing their own sin. In our text, Jesus was bringing out the absolute hypocrisy of the religious leaders in their dogged defense of ceremonial hand washing before meals. Well, at the same time, they flagrantly violated the fifth commandment. So there was just terrible hypocrisy there. They were defending ceremonial washing. They were talking about how important that is. Well, at the same time, they were flagrantly violating the fifth commandment. And the fifth commandment is honor your father, father and your mother. So this is why Jesus called them hypocrites in verse 6. What they were doing was both duplicitous and absurd. And this isn't the only time that Jesus pointed this out, by the way. There are some classic examples in Matthew 23 where Jesus really lays into them, and I'm going to show you those now. But keep in mind, this is a problem, this hypocrisy, this duplicity, this just focusing on the traditions and ignoring the word of God itself. This is something the Pharisees always did. And here are some examples of what Jesus said to the, to the Pharisees in Matthew 23. The first is in verse 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. 
because you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. See what he's saying there. They were committing horrendous sin against impoverished widows. They were taking advantage of them. And before they did this, and well they did it, they offered long and eloquent prayers to God. See the hypocrisy? Just incredible, flagrant hypocrisy. It's horrible. But before we're too hard on them, how many of you have ever gauged spirituality in a person by how eloquent they pray? You know what I'm saying? You'd be surprised how we can slip into these mindsets and not even realize it. Also, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these things you should have done without neglecting the others. So the idea here is they meticulously and laboriously tithed of every substance in their house. Do you see what he's saying? Their mint and their cumin and their dill. They're going through and tithing up everything so they're meticulous about it. While at the same time, they're turning a blind eye to the obvious matters of justice and mercy and faithfulness that are clearly preached in God's law. So they seem to be missing the point of God's law completely. And again, <clears throat> the problem isn't with the religious observances themselves. He says, don't leave the other undone. He says, he says, do those things, but focus upon the actual commandments of God's word first. And don't treat the traditions or these observances as more important than the commandments of God itself. Lastly, uh, near the end of this, uh, this discourse by Jesus, he says, you blind guides who strain out a gnat, <clears throat> and swallow a camel. You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. And so he, Jesus is making a ridiculous statement here. He's speaking in hyperbole. He's making a ridiculous statement here to illustrate how ridiculous and absurd their hypocritical behavior appeared to those looking on. You see what he's saying? To those looking on, it was like they were straining out a gnat while swallowing a camel. It was absolutely ridiculous what they were doing. And the important thing to understand here is that these religious leaders didn't realize how hypocritical and absurd that they were behaving. Their obsession with religious tradition and their self-confidence in observing it was blinding them to the reality of their sin. They didn't see it. To those looking on, the religious leaders looked extremely hypocritical and ridiculous. But the religious leaders viewed themselves as pillars of virtue the entire time. Why? because they couldn't see their sin. Their preoccupation with religious tradition was blinding them to it the whole time. All I could see is how well they were following the religious tradition. They couldn't see how poorly they were following God's law overall. They were living in a vacuum, is what's going on here. And if I might illustrate how this works, how you can just not see whole chunks of your life that you're failing in. Um, something happened years ago, I can't even remember how long it was ago now, but the kids were a lot smaller. But. I can remember, I used to really get on the kids a lot about table manners. We'd sit at the table, we'd eat together, and if I'd hear the kids lip smacking, or you know, if they would, if they seemed like they were eating a little bit sloppily, I might get on them and tell them to quit slouching, sit at the table, and use good table manners. I used to get on them quite a bit about that. And finally, one time we're sitting at the table, and I was getting on one of the kids about bad table manners, and Holly broke in and said, have you ever seen yourself eat? You know? And I was like, uh, no, obviously. She says, you should see yourself eat. You know, obviously she'd been watching this go on for a while. And so I listened very carefully. I was like, okay, kids, you have my permission. You can illustrate for me how I eat, and I promise there won't be any consequences. And I sat back and watched, and watched each of the kids doing various things, imitating things that they saw me do. One of them put their elbows on the table and put their face over the plate and started shoving food in like a, like a crane or something. And I can remember Abby in particular um, picking up a, a, a fork full of food and then opening, opening her mouth really wide going, you know, and putting it in, illustrating how wide I opened my mouth when I put it in, and one of them was slapping their lips together again. This was a long time ago, uh, but it was somewhat hilarious and not at the same time because what I was doing was seeing just how bad my table manners were as I was telling them, don't slouch at the table, you know, sit up. I was doing, I was worse than all of them at it, basically. The idea here is that because we're fallen human beings, we have a propensity to focus on the messages that we want to hear and the things that we want to believe about ourselves, but we have a, a tendency to silence everything else. 
And if we live in a vacuum for long enough, we only hear and see the things that we like, and we become completely blind to our shortcomings, just like the religious leaders. We can have blind spots in our life where we have no idea that we're flagrantly failing, but we can't see it because we have blinders on, just like I was with my table manners. And with this in mind, we need to hear the hard things and the things that challenge our beliefs and the things that shed light on our shortcomings, or we too become, can become hypocrites like the religious leaders in our text. Sticking with the example, um, I was behaving in a very hypocritical way at the table, and it was outside voices bringing this to light that helped me to see it. I, I, didn't, I was blinded to it myself. I needed that from outside. But that's the uh, first response. So here's the second response. Jesus' second response was to the crowds looking on, and it was eventually explained to the to the disciples in more detail later in the text, but it can be summarized in this way. You are no cleaner than the religious leaders because your hearts are defiled. You are no cleaner than the religious leaders because your hearts are defiled. After Jesus responded to the religious leaders, he turned to the crowds. He told them this parable. And I'm gonna advance the slide in just a second when I see you guys done writing. The parable is in verse 15. There is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile him. Jesus was was presenting two arguments with this parable, and we'll look at the second under the next point, but the first is simply this, and the idea here is this. It's not what you put into yourselves from outside that's the problem. Rather, the problem comes from what's already in there. And I'll say that again. It's not what you put into yourself from outside that's the problem. The problem comes from what's already in there. Does that make sense? Jesus is basically telling the crowds that they are defiled, not because they don't ceremonially wash their hands, but because sin and wickedness already exists in their hearts. Does that make sense? That's what he's saying here. And Jesus gives a pretty extensive list of these defilements in verses 21 and 20 through 23 of the text. Follow along with me. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Now as we consider this list, All of us in this room can probably identify with certain aspects of it. But the operative question for this study is, where do these defilements come from? Or I should say in another way, when did they arrive in my heart? Did I put these defilements in my heart over time through a variety of choices and actions? Or have they been there all along? To ask the question another way, Is the wickedness in my heart a function of my life choices or are my life choices a function of the wickedness in my heart? See what I'm asking here? It's kind of a troubling question, isn't it? It's kind of like asking what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? That's what he's getting at, though, in this parable. Now, by way of fair warning, through this question, we're going to wade into all, we, we, you can be wading into all kinds of doctrinal controversy. In particular, you're going to be wading into a, a doctrine called the depravity of man and five-point Calvinism as a system, and I'm not going to elaborate on it here. Uh, we're just not going to do that this morning. It's, I think it's beyond the scope of the study. But if you're interested, I would encourage you to see Pastor Mark, because my understanding is that on his first date with Anne, uh, their subject of conversation was five-point Calvinism, right? Yeah so, yeah, so he ought to know an awful, awful lot about it and would be happy to elaborate. I'm sure he can fill you in. But as far as this text is concerned, it seems to suggest that the defilements in our hearts were there all along. We didn't put them there over time. They were there to begin with. And that brings us to our last point, okay? The last point is this. Uh, it's to the, to the crowds as well who are looking on. And this last point is a real zinger, okay? It can be summarized in this way. Neither external observances nor the lack thereof have any bearing on the condition of our hearts. I'll say it again. Neither external observances or the lack thereof have any bearing on the condition of our hearts. 
Note what Jesus said in the first part of that parable back in verse 15 uh, that he told the crowds. I'm gonna give you a second and I'll put it back up on the board. We're gonna revisit that parable again, but we're gonna look at the first half of it this time, not the second half. Verse 15 says this, there is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. And that first part is what's interesting this time. Jesus is clarifying that external observances like ceremonial hand washing have no bearing on the condition of our hearts, one way or the other. If we observe them faithfully, like the religious leaders did, then our hearts are no better. And if we ignore them completely, our hearts are no worse. Again, external observances like these have no bearing on our hearts one way or the other. Do you see that's what he's saying there? That is what he's saying. And now that it's out there on the table, we've got to admit, this opens up an absolutely huge can of worms, doesn't it? If you really stop and think about the implications of that, this is one of the most radical passages in the entire uh, book of Mark. And it foreshadows Acts chapter 11 where, where all of the animals were cleansed and stuff like that. It's really opening up a can of worms. Let me give you some questions. And I, these are not up on the board, so you'll just have to do your best to, uh, to follow along. But let me give you some questions that might follow along in your minds when I make this statement. Again, external observances like these have no bearing on the condition of our heart. First question. If nothing we do has any bearing on the condition of our hearts, then what hope do we have? Is it even possible to have our hearts purified? Do you see why we would want to ask that question? These external observances don't do it, so what's, what's the solution here? Obviously, the solution is Jesus Christ himself and his provision on the cross, but in a more functional way, the provision is to walk in the Spirit, and we could say a whole lot more about that. But in huge summary, really going over, glossing over a lot, we can honestly say that as you walk in the Spirit, as you obey Christ, follow the leading of His Spirit, and stay in His will moment to moment, day to day, as you just obey the, the process of staying where He has you and applying yourself, over time, He cleanses your heart. He does it in you as you walk in Him. That's the way it happens. External observances, it isn't affected by how much you pray and do devotions. I'm not saying those things are bad. I'm saying that isn't what cleanses your heart. Walking in the Spirit, abiding in Him, and Him cleansing you is how it works. As you abide in Him, He's going to bring you through all kinds of tough things, and He's going to purify you that way. Second question. If nothing we do has any bearing on the condition of our hearts, then why do we pray and read our Bibles and go to church and such things as that. If these actions have no cleansing effect upon our hearts, then why do them at all? Good question, right? Something to think about. Answer, kind of tying off the one before, we don't do them to cleanse our hearts. We're not supposed to pray before our meals or we're read our Bibles every morning or go to church, or go to, church excuse me, to cleanse our hearts. That's not the purpose of them. The purpose of these things, all of them, is to know the Lord. It's different. They're not designed to purify us. They're designed to help us to know the Lord better, who himself has the ability to puri purify our hearts. We do them to know him, not to purify our hearts. So do them. Just do them, don't do them to purify yourself. Do them to know Jesus better. Third question. This is probably one that's going to come up even more. If nothing we do has any bearing upon the condition of our hearts, then why on earth is the Old Testament filled filled? with um, extensive instructions on ceremonial cleanliness and external observances. And you have to admit, all you have to do is open the Bible to Leviticus chapter 11 and follow it through to verse 15, and it's filled with nothing but ceremonial cleanliness and observances that you have to follow, rigorous ones, in order to maintain ceremonial cleanliness. If those things are in the Old Testament, why are they even there if these things don't purify our hearts and they never did to begin with? You ever ask that question? You ever ask why that stuff's in the Old Testament? The answer is that these laws both revealed the utter sinfulness of man and their inability to keep them, and they also foreshadowed Jesus. Uh, the idea here is, is that they illustrated, they, they pointed to Jesus. And Israel, the Israelites um, who actually and faithfully kept these things, they better understood their own sinfulness and their Savior. So the ones who kept them correctly 
became very aware, painfully aware of how utterly sinfully wretched they were. And they also saw in them a provision for a savior. And for the, for the Jew or anyone else to come to a different conclusion means they were keeping them wrong. If you kept them correctly, they pointed you towards the same things that Jesus is saying in our text. And lastly, on the flip side, if nothing we do has any bearing on the condition of our hearts, one way or the other, then what's keeping us from doing whatever we want? We've already talked about why, you know, you know, why um, devotions or reading our Bible or going to church doesn't purify us. Those things don't make our hearts better. Well, the same thing is true about external observances to make ourselves worse. If there's nothing that we do to make, to make our hearts worse, then what's keeping us from doing whatever we want with our bodies, sitting in whatever, we want, in whatever way we want, just doing whatever we feel like doing? The answer is that just because a certain action or environment doesn't um, directly corrupt us, it doesn't mean that it's not harmful. I mean, I, I think the best way to think about it would be is if you have a problem with alcoholism, you don't want to hang out in a bar. We're not saying that a bar is worse than anything else. Uh, and, and it might be okay for one person to be in there and another not, but if you have a problem with alcoholism, then you don't need to be in the bar. You know what I'm saying? The environments themselves do have the power to inflame the corruption that's already in our hearts. The corruption's there inside our hearts, and that's where the issue is. But the environments, which are ten, in, in a sense neutral, they have the ability to inflame those things in us in a certain way. So that's why it's different from different strokes for different folks. Uh, it, you might feel okay to watch an R-rated movie. One person might feel okay about it, another person might not. You know, it just varies from person to person. It's because those things themselves are relatively neutral. That's why Paul said all things are lawful, but all things are not helpful. It's not that one thing is sinful and another is not. It's that all things have the potential to bring out the sinfulness that's already in our heart. And we have to be discerning as individuals which thing we do and which thing we don't. So don't abstain from things that are bad because you're trying to purify your hearts or to keep your hearts from being more defiled. They're already defiled. Stay away from them because it's going to bring out the defilement that's already in there. So just a different idea. Now, I was thinking about just elaborating on these questions in more detail, but I think I'm going to pass. I, I know that I've really only touched on the beginning of them. If you have any more questions about these things, uh, I apologize that we can only gra graze them in detail, but that is the reality. Uh, those are the kind of questions that come up. And let me, in conclusion, just give you some big ideas to walk away with today off this text, okay? Here's the big picture ideas. First, outward observances like ceremonial hand washing in Jesus' day or spiritual disciplines today don't make us more spiritually pure. Do you follow me? We're not going to be more spiritually pure by praying before we eat. We're not going to become less spiritually pure by not praying before we eat or any other discipline for that matter. This is not because there's anything wrong with these disciplines. It's because our root problem is within the heart and the outward observances don't touch the heart. And I'm not saying, I want to be clear here, I'm not saying stop doing the disciplines. Just don't do them to be spiritually purified. Do them to know Jesus. Do them to learn more about him. It's a different reason. And in, in that sense, they have great benefit, okay? Secondly, make your first priority keeping the commandments of God. Make your number one first priority keeping the commandments of God, obeying God's word at all costs. Why? Because the more we emphasize external observances over God's commands, the more we become blind to our sinfulness and the more we become self-righteous. Self-righteousness and blindness to your sinfulness run together. And again, they come because we, in general, because we are observing external things above the word of God itself. But the more we genuinely seek to keep God's commandments, the more we become aware of our sinfulness and the more we will look for a savior. Does that make sense? There's a lot here. So if you have questions later, let me know. This is probably one of the most controversial texts in the book of Mark. So I did my best. And with that said, let's pray and let God do the rest, okay? Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you that all things are clean. But at the same time, we thank you uh, that you have given us direction on what to do with that information. We recognize that the problem is in our hearts and that we can't touch it. But you have made provision for all of that through the cross, through your spirit, and through your involvement with us in this world. And we pray that you would help us to walk in your spirit and be cleansed in that way. And we pray that you would generate within our hearts a new passion and a new vigor and excitement to follow the commands of your word, to do what's right, to do what your word says no matter what. And don't let anything external in this world keep us from that.
We ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.